Thank you, Paolo. Uh, Dr. Amir Kugelman comes uh, to us from Haifa, Israel. Dr. Kugelman. Good afternoon. I'm going to update you today on an ongoing study entitled High Flow Nasal Cannula versus Nasal Intermittent Positive Pressure Ventilation for the Primary Treatment of RDS, a randomized control prospective study. My disclosure, Vapotherm Incorporation supplies the equipment for the high flow nasal cannula in our study. My second disclosure is that I'm coming from the beautiful city of Haifa in Israel. And my third disclosure is that it's not me in the picture. <laughs> because mechanical ventilation is associated with morbidity, mainly BPD, the trend today is to minimize the use of mechanical ventilation. Currently, the two established modes for nasal respiratory support are nasal continuous positive air pressure, nasal CPAP, and nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, NIPPV. Nasal support was shown to be effective in treating infants in the acute phase of RDS and enables the avoidance of mechanical ventilation in a relatively large number of infants. While nasal CPAP is currently the common practice for the initial treatment of RDS, NIPPV is probably more beneficial and we have shown it in our study published in JPEDS 2007. We have shown that the rate of endotracheal de ventilation decreased significantly with NIPPV compared to nasal CPAP, and the consequence was a decreased rate of BPD. And I know that today we had a different result in a very large study, but I think it really depends on the experience. This is the experience in our hands. So NIPPV is our drug of choice for nasal support in our unit. However, recently, high-flow nasal cannula is frequently used to deliver oxygen and the mode of nasal respiratory support. No randomized prospective study was published yet that compared high-flow nasal cannula to NIPPV for the primary treatment of RDS. So the objective of our study was to determine the need for endotracheal ventilation in preterm infants treated with early high-flow nasal cannula compared with NIPPV for the primary treatment of RDS. This was a prospective randomized controlled single-center clinical trial, and it is an ongoing study. The study was approved by the RRB and our center. All the parents signed an informed consent and we performed an intention to treat analysis with a sample size calculation of 40 infants in each arm of the study. Early nasal support, high flow nasal cannula, or NIPPV, was initiated in any spontaneously breathing premature infants showing signs of respiratory distress, the kipnea granting nasal flaring or retractions. If nasal support was indicated, the mode was decided randomly between high flow nasal cannula and NIPPV. Crossover between groups was not encouraged, but was allowed. Infants that were born in our center during the study period were included in the study if they met the inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria were the stational age less than 35 weeks and weight of more than 1,000 grams, infants with RDS who needed nasal support as initial therapy, and written informed consent. Excluded were infants with significant morbidity apart from RDS, including cardiac disease, not including PDA, congenital malformation, or cardiovascular or respiratory instability because of sepsis, anemia, or severe IVH. The respiratory management, and I think it's very important, and the tracheal intubation was performed in the delivery room if heart rate did not increase to more than 100 beats per minute, the infant had insufficient spontaneously respiratory effort, or if he had marked an increasing dyspnea. Exogenous surfactant was given only as rescue therapy. For the high-flow nasal cannula, high-flow nasal cannula was delivered with a Vapotherm device using flows between one to five liters per minute. 
flows were started low on one liter per minute and increased at intervals of one liter per minute according to the clinical condition, looking at respiratory hemodynamic situation, ventilation, and oxygenation. FAO2 was set to keep SPO2 between 88 to 92 percent. The high flow nasal cannula was given via the vapotherm nasal prongs. Leak was created and allowed by using the nasal prongs no larger than half the diameter of the nurse and no chin wrap was allowed. For the NIPPV, NIPPV was delivered by the SLE 2000 or 5000 via nasal prongs. NIPPV was set at synchronized mode, rate of 12 to 30 breaths per minute according to PCO2, I, I time of 0.3, PEEP of 6 centimeters of water, PAP of 14 to 22 centimeters of water according to chest exclusion and the infant's weight. FAO2 again was set to keep SPO2 between 88 to 92 percent. The primary outcome measure was the percent of infants who failed nasal support and needed endotracheal ventilation or a switch to another mode of nasal support. Criteria for failure of nasal support, clinical deterioration, increased respiratory de uh, distress accompanied by at least one of the following or worsening of the following, pH less than 7.2 and PCO2 of more than 60, PO2 less than 50 or SPO2 less than 88% and FAO2 of more than 50% or recurrent significant apnea requiring repeated stimulation or bag and mass ventilation despite the use of caffeine or adequate nasal support. Switch was allowed in failure of nasal support mode or in cases of nasal septal damage. And the results. This is the infant enrollment chart. During the study period, 267 infants were born less than 35 weeks. Excluded were 17, most of them because they were under 1,000 grams. After the eligible infants, 186 did not participate, 13 because they were ventilated in the delivery room. 169 infants did not need any respiratory support. One of the parents refused, and three because of technical problems. So included in the study, 64 infants, 32 on NIPPV, and 32 on high flow nasal cannula. These are the demographic characteristics of the infants, high flow nasal cannula and NIPPV, the gestational age, birth weight, prenatal steroids, and male to female infants were all comparable between the two groups. The gestational age and birth weight were slightly lower on the high flow nasal cannula group. Cardiorespiratory status at study entry, FAO2 and SPO2, PCO2 and pH, respiratory rate, heart rate, mean blood pressure were all comparable between the two groups. And these are the main findings. The rate of endotracheal ventilation was comparable between the two groups, NIPPV and high flow nasal cannula. One infant failed high flow nasal cannula and succeeded on NIPPV. The rate of BPD was comparable between the two groups. Other clinical outcomes, the hematorax, there was no significant difference, although by now we have one more infant on high flow nasal cannula and two more on NIPPV, and we had another case of pneumothorax just last week. There was no difference in trauma to the nasal septum, no in mechanical ventilation duration, no in BPD, IVH, time to full feeds, or length of stay. The nasal respiratory duration, duration support was longer on high flow nasal cannula compared to INIPPV, maybe because we felt more comfortable and the nurses felt more comfortable with a high flow nasal cannula. So the conclusion, high flow nasal cannula seems to be as effective as an IPPV in preventing endotracheal ventilation in the initial treatment of RDS in premature infants less than 35 weeks gestation and weighing more than 1,000 grams. Additional studies in smaller infants are needed to support this conclusion. Our study provides the basis for further larger trials of this intervention before it can be concluded that high flow nasal cannula is safe and can serve as a primary mode of nasal support in premature infants with RDS. Thank you. <laughs>